This is Linda Lee Johnson, and this is our third week in the Body of Light. Tonight, we're going to be talking about identification and true identity. Is our identity in Christ within from our peace, our freedom, our joy and fulfillment, or do we find our identity in ideologies or possessions? The identifying process Human beings are the only unspecialized creation in the world. All others are specialized. Bees make honey, they're gathers, they pollinate. Dogs are smellers, trackers, hunters. And birds are flyers and singers. Humans not being fully aware unless we identify ourselves as something, we end up feeling inferior. What authorities do we identify with? To feel important or prestigious? Is it our educational qualifications, a master's degree, a doctor, the area or district we live in, our church, our spiritual teachers, the labels on the clothes we wear, Louis Vuitton, Calvin Klein, the car we drive, a BMW, a Mercedes? Oh, I remember those days when I felt like I had more of an identity if I had a Louis Vuitton person a, and a uh, a Lincoln, a Lincoln cotton uh, convertible. I remember those days really well. If I didn't have my Louis Vuitton purse with me, I felt like I had no identity. Oh my goodness. What identity do we put on other people? Do we talk about them as always being sick, critical, ignorant, stupid, wealthy, slender, beautiful, bright, brilliant, or religious? When we identify, we're usually judging. When I was young, I identified Arab men as being cruel, violent people. And what was really strange about that, we didn't have one single Arab in the little tiny town that I lived in in Canada. And somehow, though grandma, my grandma always said, if you ever find an Arab man, they will always have a knife and you have to be careful. Well, I never found one. People who didn't speak English were labeled bohunks and not worthy of any consideration at all. Jewish people were admired and were probably wealthy because they knew how to Jew you out of everything. Wealthy people were lucky and probably crooks, and it went on and on and on. Everybody had a judgment and a label put upon them. We do not realize the value of the non-specialized state, so we struggle to be something. We try to make ourselves into things, an occupation. I'm a teacher, a doctor, an attorney, an actress, a writer, an ideology. A Republican, a Democrat, I'm a member of Mensa, a particular university. And now he appears to be controllable. For example, Republicans do such and such, or Democrats do this other. So now we become predictable. Once we have identified with the things of this world, we can be boxed into a predictable role. My teacher always said that once you learn this material, it's almost like you're an alien. You're like invisible amongst the natives because you realize that you don't have to have a different role or if you have this role you are doing it consciously not unconsciously two people ever changing unpredictable human beings one is named john the other name is named mary they come together and john in order to know mary creates an image of her in his mind that image is static Yet the living being it refers to is an ever-changing, flowing being that cannot be known. John no longer communicates with the living being, but with the image that he's come up with. Mary does the likewise with him. And to further complicate the issue, they get married. And now they both form an image of marriage. But they have a different image. His image of marriage is comfort and pleasure, Lots of sex, good meals, and her image is everlasting romance and security. And these two people attempt to communicate with each other, but they're communicating with images. Consequently, there is a total misunderstanding. And soon, soon they and others are wondering if their marriage can ever survive. You see, images cannot communicate with images. If there is a problem with another person what image have you made that you're trying to communicate with? 
the greatest gift we can extend to anyone is to disidentify our image of them from them and extend to everyone the gift of discovering them, enjoying them outside of the old images. So what am I identified with? An addiction, job, creative endeavor, my big body, my little body, a body I need to exercise, my sick body, my husband, my wife, my child, my child support. Am I identified with what I don't have? Money, discipline, friends, decent car, control over my kids, a student grant, respect, honor. P.D. Ospensky, who was a student of Gurdjie, says, in the psychology of man's possible evolution, identification is a curious state in which one passes more than half his life. He, ad he identifies with everything, with what he says, what he feels, what he believes, what he does not believe, what he wishes or does not wish, what attracts him, what repels him. Everything absorbs him, and he cannot separate himself from the idea, the feeling, or the subject, or the object that absorbs him. This means that in the state of identification, that one is incapable of looking impartially upon the object of his identification. So man has even less control now over his mechanical reactions than at any other time. So the more we are identified, the more mechanical we are. Manifestation of unconscious identification can be lying or imagination or negative emotions. The largest identification is what Gurdjieff called considering its identification with people. It's a state in which one continually worries about what other people think of them, whether they give him due respect, do they admire him enough? Oh, and it goes on and on. With some people, it's an obsession causing worry, doubt, and suspicion. Inferiority complex is created by this identification as to what do other people think of me? Where is the inferiority complex? when you're free to be inferior. As long as we have a story that is not serving us that we are identified with, it often blocks our life purpose. Can you see that? No one can observe himself mechanically. When you are observing, you are no longer identified with the state observed. If we are always identified with our thoughts and moods or someone else's, then we cannot change. We must first divide ourselves into two and we must observe our state. The state we're in, we've got to be able to observe it. Identification with our states of being and our moods and paying attention struggle with each other. If one can just pull back and watch, actually watch it and then report like this. This one is called blaming or this is called losing one's temper. This is called being disappointed. This is called being in a mess. Do you see that you're just reporting now, but you're doing the reporting and you're not letting the, the old anxieties do the reporting, you're doing it. Or sometimes I might say, uh, Linda feels down or Linda feels burdened and anxious. Linda is blaming. Now you're reporting and you're not identifying with it. You're just reporting it. And soon you will feel better. You're reporting accurately, and besides, it kind of sounds funny, and that helps you to feel better more quickly and wake up. When we have any criticism, whether it's of someone in the class or myself, we're actually in hostility or resentment, and we're failing to see a not I number six working. What is number six? What is the not I number five? Let's take a look at it. Number six is saying, if only you were different, or if only this condition were different, I would be happy. Or number five says, oh, if only I were different. So our job is just to observe those. Those are the not eyes. They're not the real true I. The not eyes get our attention through the body to have us stay in fear, resentment, or anger. To get our attention off of our own observation, which is where our enlightenment comes from. Our enlightenment comes from observing those voices within us without judgment. They, those voices are always luring us to sensations and attractions outside of us. 
The greed of the not eyes want more, better, or different. The more we judge our circumstances outside of us and decide they need to be different, we are asleep and we are identified to an illusion. It is thinking that we know it ought to be that is keeping us out of the holy kingdom, the joyful, the spiritual consciousness, and it's keeping us from experiencing an energetic well body because the well body lives on the igniting of the correct perception of the awareness to the divine intelligence or divine principle. We're talking about a union that takes place instantly to literally produce a new being. When you're able to observe without judgment, oh my goodness, it is so wonderful. Infinite intelligence then gets the message that you've observed and does the, the appropriate thing. And it's so wonderful. You see, we're not involved in the science of right thinking to manipulate this human scene to make it, uh, to make it wonderful. We're talking about self-observation. It's called self-knowing to unite our being into a new state of oneness, to awaken us from fragmentation, which has depleted us, dissipated us, caused our aches and pains. All diseases, all lack, and all poverty come from being asleep comes from how many times have we tried to please people in order to get their approval? How many times have we looked for attention to escape being ignored or rejected? How many times have we done everything we could so that we would have a sense of being important and needed to escape in fury? Your unfoldment is what is important from within you. That only comes authentically to you when you can laugh thrilled that you saw another not eye. You saw it without judgment. That not eye was trying to defile awareness with judgments of someone else. But you see, they're not a power when you wake up to them. They are actually nothing. They have no power. They have no substance at all. They live on your belief in them. The day will come when you will take every opportunity to observe the not eyes. Oh, and then infinite intelligence will be the initiator in your life, giving you such untold joy and awareness. And then the body will be governed by infinite intelligence. The mind will be clean and clear, harmonious and vital, and the joy you will have. When one has been aware of the not eyes and in being aware of them has seen them disappear, one is in a very special state state of discovery and allowing. And what had them leave? The correct reporting to infinite intelligence. And then infinite intelligence took the appropriate actions, the light or the igniting of the awareness, annihilated anything that was not of God. Because of our hypnotism and trying to gain an escape, we've made many powers out of everything. The carnal mind with its not eyes from fear, resentment, and anger produces its own image and likeness, bringing us less than optimal life. Just so long as we have criticisms within us, we are missing out. And in that moment, to receive true substance that is permeated with life. And this is all around us. The field around us is so glorious, but we never know it when we are involved in our own self-critical, uh, in our own self-criticisms. The Bible says, shine, be radiant with the glory of the Lord, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That's Isaiah 60, verse 1. And all that means is that your true awareness or perception makes you shine and be radiant with the love and the spirit of God. The moment you are operating in true awareness, your light has come and the glory of God falls upon you and in you. The Odes of Solomon were found as part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is believed that they were written in the first century. It is believed that these people were with Jesus and that they were called Essenes. Odes of Solomon number 11. 
I threw off the madness of the earth. I threw it from me and I cast it away. And the Lord renewed me in his raiment and held me in his light. He is my son and his rays have lifted me up and chased all darkness from my face. The madness of the Nadis is what I threw from me. I threw it out of my awareness. I cast it away and God or infinite intelligence renewed me, body, mind and soul, in his raiment, in his life and in his substance, in his attributes and held me in his light or awareness, awareness that is in union with God. Oh, I love these words from St. Paul. He said, all of us then reflect the glory of the Lord with uncovered faces. And that same glory coming from the Lord, who is the Spirit, transforms us into his very likeness in an ever degree of glory. And glory means the praise of God, awesome splendor, majesty, astounding beauty, beauty that inspires feelings of wonder or joy the bliss of heaven, state of great happiness, satisfaction. With every criticism that is not observed, we are missing that still small voice that is saying, come, receive the kingdom which has been, been prepared for you since the creation of the world. I'm going to share with you now a story who, of a man who had been involved with these teachings for some time before he was called upon to serve in Vietnam. And this is a man who knew his identity and knew the identity of God. During his service there, he was in an ambush where all the other soldiers he was with were killed and he was left for dead by the Viet Cong. He had been unconscious for perhaps a day when he was awakened to find he had been seriously injured. He had a gaping hole in his abdomen and he reported one thing before he fell to sleep, unconscious again. And again, that infinite intelligence he knew could be trusted to deal with what is. He rested in radical reliance upon the nature of God that he knew and, about, and, uh, and upon that knowing. Now this was someone who knew the power of reporting accurately to infinite intelligence. He awakened again much later to see something amazing. His entire wounded area was white and moving. It was full of maggots, living, moving, tenacious maggots. He again fell into unconsciousness, but before doing so, he reported that infinite intelligence was dealing with what is to his highest advantage. Six hours later, he awakened to find the maggots gone and his wound completely cleaned out. He was rescued and he was sent to a hospital and later sent back to the United States. He lived to tell a story and went on to teach classes like this one. This man, unlike some of us, knew that maggots are life and that they eat filth. He knew that infinite intelligence could be trusted to deal with what is, with a lot more intelligence than anything he could come up with. Note that his identification at this time was to infinite intelligence that was his life. So his identification wasn't with a gaping hole. It wasn't with the maggots or the fear of death or the Viet Cong. He rested in his true identity. He rested in his authentic self. And I believe that we're being asked at this time to live in this authentic self all the time. And I personally do not know any other way of doing it except from self-observation. We are peeling back the onion skins of the knot eyes, bringing them into the light of our awareness so that our authentic self can lead and guide us to the appropriate actions that we need to take. We can learn how to purify the subtle energies that are around us by surrendering concepts of our body and our mind. Whatever concept we have of our body is keeping regeneration at bay. And every concept that I am too weak or too sick is creating thought forms and projections from us that are marring 
the invisible matrix from which the body is being continually regenerated. Once we assign a label to ourselves or to someone else, we've given up the ability or the right to allow truth to resonate. We need to be innocent to labels. We need to we need to be fresh and original, so new in every moment that we can't be confused with a shadow. We can't be confused with something lifeless and rigid. We have to quit playing with shadows, which is what labels are. We have wanted to move shadows around in directions we think are appropriate. But we need to understand the difference between ourself and our imagined self. That part of us that we created through our mind, through our thoughts, that limited self we created and all the things that happened because of its creation, which could be self-promotion, addiction, selfishness, and all the needs of the shadow self. The shadow self knows it's limited, it knows it needs to support, it knows that it needs support, and it becomes therefore something that hoards, something that takes, it becomes something that grasps in order to support itself. The problem here is that the mind confuses true support with shadow support. Since the mind lives in shadows, it believes shadows can help as it keeps working to create more and more things, more and more shadows to support itself. When the truth it is, it has to realize that the only support that exists is outside of the shadow self, outside of that mind. Then it can begin to comprehend that there must be a break between itself and all the shadows, all its shadow creations and all it thinks it needs for its own support. When that break occurs, when that connection to the world of shadows stops, then time stops. Everything of the old stops. And only when it stops can real life begin. It is only when we enter the open space of stillness that true life can begin. Then we stop living in the world of shadows. And only those people who've entered this real life can show others what real life is. True aid and assistance come as we get closer and closer to that truth. That truth is the only reality. It's the only assistance, the only aid, the only doer, the only one that can cause change within any being who is searching. Change occurs because influences of the shadow world cease. The influence is no longer the reaction of the mind. The mind has lost its influence. That's the old mind. We have learned to observe it. We have entered a different realm. We've entered a realm of holiness. And this is the realm of the qualities of God. The realm which gives and does not take.